welcome to Ledyard Farm, where we are hosting the 1990 Ledyard Horse Trials and three-day event. This is Brian O'Connor, and we're going to take you on a historical view of Ledyard. We're going to show you the competition from novice all the way up through the advanced levels. We're going to take you behind the scenes and talk to the competitors and find out from the organizers what they had in mind when they put this fantastic event together. Of course, our Commander-in-Chief, Mr. Neil Ayer, has done a tremendous job, as always, in putting on what has to be one of the best competitions in the country. We have lots of exciting competition for you, lots of great interviews, lots of terrific footage showing you the jumps, showing you things behind the scenes, and of course, the horses and riders that make the competition. We hope that you will enjoy the legend of Ledger, and now let's get right to it. I'm uh, Neil Ayer, and I'm here to welcome you all to Legend. And by way of introducing this program you're about to see, I uh, look forward very much to it portraying the sport as I see it, and as many of us see it, and introducing you to some of the important people that make up the team that's necessary to put on a three-day event or a horse trial. It requires a tremendous amount of work and the cooperation and the enthusiasm of countless volunteers and more and more hours than you can possibly imagine to handle all of the details. And while we're standing here in front of the sign that says Legend Stable, you might be interested in why, uh, why we call this farm Legend. My grandfather was born in Legend, Connecticut, which is a very small town, quite near Mystic. And when father bought this piece of property, uh, right after the First World War, he called it Ledger in commemoration or honor of or dedication to or what you will, uh, Ledger, Connecticut, where his father was born and brought up as a small boy. And uh, one other thing I might mention is one of the people that I suspect will be seen later on in this production is uh, Fifi Coles because she has been the editor of the USCTA News ever since its inception, and she's kept horses here for 28 years, I think. And she also has considerable artistic talent, and she, in fact, uh, uh, painted this particular sign. And as to the sign behind me, uh, you'll, most of you who are acquainted with the Cushy Foundation and the macrobiotic uh, diet are aware of the fact that their motto or slogan or what you will is one peaceful world. And that seemed like an excellent slogan to have for a stable full of horses and full of people, all of whom get along very well and have a very cheerful time the year round. My name is Jim Wilson. I've been the farm, man farm manager for the years, for 23 years. And we've, we've made all the ledges over the years for Mr. Rare. And uh, this, I think this is the biggest one we've made. And uh, we more or less maintain the property of the land and, and repaint and build all the, all the stadium jumps and uh, just say that everything's ready for the show, organize it and take care of the family. That's about the job. And um, 
Well, like I said, this is the biggest one, and I probably the last one here, but I hope not. You know, it's actually fun. It's a lot of work, but it's fun. And because uh, every year you really have a different crew, because most of the men that work here are all the younger guys, you know, from schools and colleges, and they're gone. So I think that's half of the battle, because you reach by the time you train everybody, and they get really good, and the show's over. <laughs> so then you start all over again. So when, did, when you first started here 23 years ago, how did you start? Uh... I started working for Mrs. Air, where they called her Granby. That was Neil's mother. And uh, they had a big house on the top of the hill, which, he, which he actually bur it burned down. And uh, I worked for her. And then when Mrs. Air passed away, and then Neil kind of just took me over. And I just stayed on with Neil and Mrs. Air and uh, took care of their farm for them. And then when the show worked, making the show. So you've seen this whole thing grow. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've done a lot of shows. We've built them with Vic, Vic Newton and a lot of big builders, you know. We've done a lot of a lot of shows here. You were here at the first legend. Oh, yeah. What yeah. was that like? Well, I know, yeah, it was nice. It turned out well, because we've made movies here. I'm sure they've told you, you know, we made them. And sometimes, you know, like we had Tatum O'Neill here, and we made the um, International Velvet during the same time we had a show. Which makes it hectic because you got MGM, and everybody's in everybody's way, you know. Uh, and even before that, we made the um, Thomas Crown Affair with Steve McQueen. So we've had, it's been really fun because you have a lot of celebrities here and everything all the time. The first part of any three day event is, of course, the first veterinary inspection. This is when the horses are presented to the judges and the vets. The horses are checked for their soundness. This is one of three inspections that takes place during a three-day event. The second inspection takes place on the cross-country day or in the 10-minute vet box right after the second load and tracks. At that point, the horse's pulse and respiration are taken, and the horse is checked to see whether he recuperates in that 10 minutes before he is allowed to continue. The third and final examination takes place on the show jumping morning before the actual stadium jumping. At that point, the horses are once again checked for their soundness and their fitness to see if they're able to continue and go to the show jumping on the final day. This is when the rider's preparation comes into play. The months and weeks and many hours of preparation are tested right here. Is my horse fit? Is he ready to go? I'm nervous enough as it is. I hope everything's okay. And a final thumbs up, and they'll continue. Well, the story of eventing, it started first of all, I suppose, with the French in the earlier days. It was a sort of cavalry uh, competition for the cavalry. And then it was adopted for competition work. And the first badminton, I think, started what? 1949. 49. Uh, that was at badminton. And of course, it's changed considerably since then. Uh, the cross-country courses, particularly, uh, the dressage now plays a very important part in the actual end result. And also, you find, I think, that the horses now, in comparison to what we used to ride over at Babington, uh, you leave the ground a lot more times, far more technical fences and mathematical ones. Uh, and on the whole, it's improving, I think, almost every year. What do you think, Judy? The standard has improved considerably. The English have always been renowned for their cross-country and the Irish. That's why the English and the Irish horse is faithful for Aventi, because they have the cross-country. And originally, the English and the Irish were the best cross-country riders, because we had the Hunty, and we were brought up with the cross-country side, whereas the other countries haven't had that, let's say, naturally. But the standard has improved tremendously, the dressage especially. The fences have been changed. They're much more technically difficult. The different type of horse now required, much more athletic horse, much more of a jumper. And of course, the riding has improved to, to meet the demand of the courses. They're much more technical courses, so they're rider courses more now, rather than big, straightforward galloping fences. But I think we're originally the badminton type of course they've come much more demanding, much more technical. So the better rider is emerging and much more of a horseman overall in all three phases. And the show jumping phase mm. demands 
more accurate riding. But I think the courses here now at Ledyard, which is a particularly brilliantly designed course by that wizard Neil Ayres, who is really brilliant, and of course his um, course builder John Dillon, who's done a wonderful job. I mean, the finish on the fences is quite astonishing. Um, he's produced five different courses over this three days, four days, and it's brilliantly designed. I wish we could see more of these sort of fences in England, in fact. Yeah, beautifully, uh, beautifully done. Fences. And also Very taking inviting. the horse into consideration all the time. You know, he's got an eye for it. And he's done so much for your eventing in America. Um, he's been the backbone of it, really. And uh, he's wonderful. Terrific variation of fences there. Lends itself very well to the cross-country phase. So how do you feel that American eventing is coming up? Well, they've always been good. You had Jack Legoff, I mean, during his tendency, as it were, of training the teams, it was all brilliant. Obviously put a great deal of his expertise into the riders and improved them terrifically. But then again, it goes in different years. You know, sometimes you have particularly good horses and particularly good riders and they change. I think you've got to keep working at it all the time, producing young riders, producing young horses. Uh, that's the secret of it. What do you think, Judy? I agree, but there's often a shortage of good horses. They're only as good as the horses they're riding. They have to have the correct material to work with. So I think that's why they're always looking for horses in Europe and looking for the right type of horse. Um, there is a shortage of horses at the, at the top, you know, standard, especially mm. towards a three-star. That's when they begin to get thin on the ground. There's only so many of the riders know how to produce them to that standard. Luckily here, your riders do help the younger riders, and they do have quite a following of the younger students with them, which is great. So you it's think, very educational. You think well, I think the fence that's downhill, it's the sort of Stockholm fence that um, Neil's designed. I think that's a good fence to watch. And obviously the change of direction going into the water will obviously be a fence to watch too. On the whole, I wouldn't have thought it would offer a great number of problems because they've been so beautifully designed and placed. The going and everything and the approaches are so good. The coffin's a very interesting fence here. It's an old feature of Edgeard. It is a very interesting coffin because the horse doesn't see where it's landing. It's going downhill into the coffin. The clever fence, the fence that I think has caught quite a number of people in the past. We start our coverage at the Hamilton Equestrian Center. This is one of four venues for Ledger this year. At the Hamilton Equestrian Center, riders at the novice and training level will be riding the dressage portion of their competitions. Now over at Flying Horse, that's where the preliminary and advanced riders will be riding. That's also the site for the steeplechase for the preliminary three-day riders. The third site, of course, is Ledger Farm, which hosts the cross country on Saturday. And then over at Groton House Farm, the fourth venue, that's where the show jumping will be held. And by the way, that's also where the riders are stabled throughout the duration of the week. There's a lot of excitement in the air as riders have traveled from all over the country to be here. There are over 300 scheduled rides for all levels this weekend. That's one of the biggest turnouts for any event ever in this country. Competitors are not only vying for the individual honors and ribbons, but they're also part of the Eastern States Regional Adult Team Championships, which has generated a lot of interest in the sport of combined training. And Neil has been one of the big founders of that Adult Team Championship. Now let's take a slight break from the dressage coverage here, and we'll take you out on the first cross-country course. What we're going to try to do in the coverage here is show you each of the courses, the novice training prelim and the advanced courses and take you out with Neil and John Dillon, the course builder, and get some of their ideas and viewpoints about what cross country should be.
Long before I was born, the original Legend Farm stable was right behind me. And uh, I'm not sure whether the camera can pick it up, but there are some rocks there that identify uh, the corner of the old foundation. And uh, in this area here, there was a well about 50 feet deep. And until quite recently, the well was covered with a board so the horses wouldn't fall into it. And what we're looking at here is the novice level and the training level uh, water complex. And the rules now require that, or rather, don't allow you to jump a novice horse into water, so the novice horses will simply go down the ramp and then jump out on the far side. Uh, the training horses will come from the distance there over the uh, vertical pressure treated rail fence into the water and out. It's a very simple water jump, both for the novice uh, division and for the training division. And I've done that on purpose because this year we have the, we're hosting the adult team championship and the adult team championship is a very popular uh, competition. This is only its second year in existence and it attracts really the competitor who does this for the fun of it, who rides three or four mornings a week and uh, is in no way professional and has almost what you might call the backyard horse. And they're really the foundation of the sport. They're the people that make the bulk of the entry. We have uh, a couple of hundred competitors entered in our novice division, in our training division. And this is true all over the country. And so we've made an enormous effort this year at Ledger uh, to emphasize the importance of the lower level competitor and the best prizes are going to them and the best judges are being used for their dressage and the ribbons that they'll receive will all say adult uh, team championship and we're making a big big fuss about it and the only other comment that I really have to make here is about the well uh, we, we rebuilt the well probably not exactly as it looked in 1896 but uh, pretty close to and we think it makes for a very decorative water jump and then the other comment is purely technical and may not be appropriate for the uh, coverage that we're providing here but as a course designer I'm now building water jumps, firstly out in the open where everybody can see them, secondly on the tops of rises where the footing is always good because most water jumps are built in ditches like the one behind you or in rivers or in low places that naturally collect water and the horses often punch through and fall or the rains come and the water gets too high. Uh, they're usually located in streamlines, which are so far away from where the crowd is, the crowd never gets to see the water jump, and the water jump is the most popular jump on a course. And so in my building now, I, number one, uh, pick a place that has lots of area around it where people can uh, spectate, can watch. I put, put concrete in the bottom so there's no chance of a horse ever putting his foot through. I build it on high enough ground so no matter what kind of weather you have, the footing will remain good. And then in the water jump itself, I put gravel or, and sand uh, so that when the horse jumps in, he's not jumping onto concrete, he's jumping onto a good solid, but a movable, flexible, uh, proper type of a surface. So that's probably enough about course building and my philosophies on, on my philosophy on water jumps. But I think it's quite important, and I think that a lot of courses around the country are following this lead or copying this idea or Maybe I copied it from them, and that. Well, there you have the novice course, a beautiful use of natural obstacles and natural material. That's one of Neil's trademarks. And also, his yellow and red signs. A little last-minute touch-up here, getting a couple of signs ready to go out on the course for tomorrow. Now, as we mentioned earlier, this uh, particular competition this weekend is taking place at four different venues. Now, on Friday, we not only had the novice and the training dressage, but at Flying Horse Farm, we start with a three-day preliminary. 
Now here's Darren Cha-Cha and Labrette. Labrette owned by Stacy Lundquist, and Darren's had a very successful year in competition at the preliminary level. He competed at Millbrook at the DeBroke Championships just about a month ago. He's done a real nice job with this horse. And uh, Darren seems to be putting in a fairly, uh, fairly accurate test here. Horse just uh, looks a little bit uptight, but uh, I think the more he gets into this particular test, uh, he's starting to relax and uh, starting to pay attention. Now, there's a very nice trot there. Here at Flying Horse, uh, Pingrees have done uh, a marvelous job, as always, in getting everything ready for the dressage here at Ledger. And this is, of course, uh, where the Young Riders were held just about uh, two, three years ago, the Young Rider Championships. Here we have uh, a familiar Davidson name, but this is Buck Davidson, Bruce's son, and Noah. This is one of uh, Bruce's old troopers that he uh, had competing uh, for the last couple of years, all the way up through the advanced level. And Buck is uh, doing one of his uh, very first three days aboard uh, this experienced competitor. And Buck's doing a fairly good job here. Oops, a little control there, hang on. And now we switch over to Dad. And here's Bruce Davidson and the Wolf. This is one of Bruce's uh, new youngsters that uh, he's bringing up through the ranks. He's been competing uh, the Wolf at uh, training and preliminary over the last over the last year, I should say, and uh, is now taking him in, I believe, one of his first three days too. Bruce, of course, uh, one of the most recognizable figures in the event world here in the United States, and of course internationally throughout the world. Two-time world champion, and recently at the Stockholm World Championships last year, last summer. He brought home the bronze medal for the United States, and he wraps up his dressage test there with a nice salute. And it turns out that uh, he has the best score in this particular division. Now, over in the adjoining ring, we have the advanced dressage, still here at Flying Horse. And we start first with Julie Gamena riding Ballyhack. She recently purchased this particular horse just about uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, it's taken a little while to sort of get used to him. He's a big, strong horse, and uh, she's done a, a very nice job in, uh, in uh, getting him relaxed. And, uh, you know, it takes a while to get a new combination uh, work together. This particular horse has, has competed at the intermediate level over the last uh, couple of years. The open three day, we have horse and uh, Julie's done a, a very good job in uh, really, uh, keeping him together and, and uh, getting both her confidence and Ballyhack's confidence up at this particular level. Here we have Susan Jackson and Dynasty, one of our West Coast participants. As we said earlier, uh, we have competitors coming from all over the country here to compete at Ledger. And there's a very nice extended trot across the diagonal. Susan's an experienced competitor. She's competed at a lot of the big competitions on the West Coast. And she's doing uh, one of the East Coast tours this fall. And here we have another recognizable face in the event world. This is Karen Lendy and Park Hall. Karen was a member of our squad that went to Seoul, Korea in 1988. Park Hall, owned by Dick and Vita Thompson from uh, Malvern, Pennsylvania, just, uh, just around the corner from Radnor. And the Thompsons own uh, three or four of Karen's horses that she competes uh, from preliminary all the way up through the advanced level. And uh, Park Hall has just recently moved up to the advanced level this fall. It's a lovely English thoroughbred. Karen has been uh, competing on. She's been doing a terrific job. This is a, a lovely moving horse. He's got a, a great sense of timing. Uh, he's very elegant to look at. 
and uh, he's a superb jumper. Karen's uh, really done a commendable job moving up him up through the ranks, up now to advanced. Karen was also the winner of the first Fair Hill three-day that took the place of Chesterland last uh, fall with Noze Ku. She's putting in quite a ni nice test here. And here we have Charlie Plum and Landino. We wind down our coverage of the dressage portion for the advanced competitors. This is the uh, 1990 three-day championship horse and rider combination from the fall. They were the winners of Fair Hill. And Charlie's putting in a, a nice test here with Landino. Charlie's got his hands full here. Looks like Landon is ready to go cross country right now. My horse is uh, an English bred horse. Uh, he's probably a seven-eighths bred. Um, he's not papered, so I'm not sure what exactly his breeding is. Uh, he's 12 years old. He has been doing the advanced level for uh, some years over in England. I purchased him last uh, fall, late, late in the season, and uh, I've been riding him since. Um, He's an adequate mover. I think uh, in the year that I've had him, I, th I hope that he's gotten better. I think he's still got room to, be, to become better and uh, be more competitive, uh, especially in the dressage ring. Um, he's a good horse, very kind horse in the barn, a very workmanlike uh, disposition. He comes out, he's the same every day. He wants to come out and work. He tries his hardest for me. Uh, he's, very good, very loving horse. And you love him too. And I love him too. <laughs> you gotta love these. You gotta love them because uh, if you don't love them, you know, you then you're just not having a good time. And, and if that's the case, you might as well get out of the sport because it's it takes too much time, too much effort to do it, and not really love this whole thing. And I love horses, and I just love the sport. It's uh, I just get a a real kick out of uh, galloping across country and jumping big obstacles. Uh, it's a thrill that uh, is immeasurable. No one knows it until they've done it. You think your horse likes it? Yeah, otherwise he wouldn't do it, you know, um, especially at the advanced level. Um, you can get a, you can push a horse at the lower levels and, and get them through, a, you know, a small course uh, just by being a you know sh a sh good rider, but at the advanced level, um, for the horse to, to be good at it and be consistently good at it, they have to enjoy doing it because the fences are big, substantial obstacles, and uh, the horses have to be hungry and, and aggressive and want to go out there and do it. Here we have David O'Connor and the Magic Dragon, owned by Carla Skinder. There's an interesting little story here. Carla was uh, riding in one of the novice divisions yesterday on the cross country, and she had uh, a little mishap with a tree, and uh, she unfortunately has dislocated her shoulder. So uh, she was supposed to ride here in the advanced division, so she was asking around to try to find someone to ride uh, her horse here. And uh, David was just scheduled to come up and uh, coach some of his students here. So uh, he pulled together, was able to find some, uh, some equipment, and uh, so here he is with a catch ride in the advanced division. This little Appaloosa was the uh, horse of the year in 1988. Appaloosa horse of the year, I should say. And has been doing very well over the last couple of years with, uh, with a couple of different riders. Carlos recently uh, purchased him. Here we have what turns out to be the winning ride of the advanced uh, dressage 
Day. This is Bruce Davidson and Mystic Hazard. Bruce putting in another one of his very precise and very accurate dressage tests, and he uh, ends up uh, getting a score of 43.8, which puts him in the lead. Karen Lendy with Park Hall takes second with 48.0. David O'Connor, the Magic Dragon, tied for third with Julie Gamena and Ballyhack. And uh, then we have Loney Forbes and Romero Prince uh, moving First into sixth place. So those are the top, fifth place, I should say. So those are the top five in the advanced division. Well, let's go over to Ledger now, where we have underway the novice cross country. And we start the coverage with Fifi Coles. And here's Fifi Coles and Paris on the front part of the course there. See, we have a lovely day for the cross country. And as we said, uh, the event being held at so many different places, uh, the scheduling was so, so hectic that they had to have so many uh, things going on at the same time. So we have dressage going on over at Flying Horse, cross country going on Friday and Saturday, and then all of the show jumping will be held on Sunday. We'll have two courses going, one for the training and novice, and one for the prelim and the advanced. Ah, Fifi's doing a great job on the course there, nicely through the water and over the open ditch. Here we have Judy Westlake and Agate of Merritt. And she winds her way through the woods. And nicely over the vertical, two strides, the in and out there at 4AB. And out of the woods there over the rails. Another uh, nice aspect that both Neil and John have, uh, have put in their courses, the use of light and dark, you know, coming from the woods into the open field and vice versa. There's a nice jump over the stone wall. And now on into the water complex by the wishing well. Oop, getting a little tight there, but she's all right. Make the uh, 180 turn. And uh, here's where the horses are. Uh, Really will take a peek at that ditch. You know, they've already come through the water and they've been backed off a little bit, so the riders really have to really send them forward over that ditch there at 10. And uh, Judy's clear there. Here's Nancy Francis and Masai Mara. A big jump over the vertical. Oh, she gets in a little bit too close there. That is two strides in there very easy, but uh, she jumped that first one. Uh, Rather big, so uh, she got a little close there to the second part. We just have seven more horses to go out on and over the stone wall. Now seven back into the main field and for the loop into the water. And here she makes the turn into the water complex. I think Neil can be very pleased. Uh, water has ridden extremely well. It's really uh, answered the question that he posed, uh, providing a nice, easy way for the horses to get into the water, and then uh, just a little jump out over the bank. Oh, really standing off there at the ditch. Nicely done. Well, let's go out on the training course now and meet up with John Dillon. This is number one for training on the training course, the first fence, and we call this the organ pipes. It's just um, a different way of doing an ascending first fence. Basically, a lot of, uh, most courses, the first, like I said before, the three to four fences would be ascending, inviting fences. And we're always looking for new ideas on ascending fences. And this is just a nice little touch on an ascending fence with a staggered different post, just like an organ pipes in the church. And again, this always jumps beautifully and something different looking, really. This is fence number five for the training. And I'm calling this, we call it the picture frame or the bullseye. Um, the 
It's the fence I've always wanted to build. It's uh, the training come up out of the woods and jump through this hole. I think myself it will jump well, but it looks really scary. But I think it will jump well, the reason being that the horses are jumping out into the daylight and they'll go for it. And I think it will frighten the riders more than anything else. I think the horses will fly through it, unless the riders are unsure themselves and therefore they will cause the problem, but not the horse. Uh, this is about one of my favourite training fences. I'm looking forward to see how this goes. Seven for the training. On our new, brand new training course this summer, we built a totally brand new training and lovers course. Um, this is the, what they call the wings. It's kind of a, a coffin fence. You jump over the ditch, one stride and up over the rail. It um, looks quite imposing for the training, but I am quite confident it'll jump well. There's an option on the side of it if no one wants to jump straight through for the less experienced training, they could jump diagonally across the ditch, up to the right and swing left-handed and jump the element up at B. But uh, I think it's quite a nice training fence and looks rather imposing. Well, now that you've seen all the fences, let's take you right to the action. We start out with uh, Shelby Woodsmansey and Bailey. Nicely through the bullseye, on across the road. And very nicely one striding through the coffin there at seven. This has turned out to be a lot tougher than people thought it was going to be. A lot of horses are really looking at that ditch and either jumping out very big on top of that bank puts them in a very, very close uh, takeoff position for the rails, or else they're actually jumping to the right or refusing. And Shelby's there uh, through the water complex. Again, that's a rails, and then down to the water, jumping in. And here we have uh, Wash Bishop and Askaway, nicely through the bullseye. And it uh, turns out that these horses uh, are jumping the bullseye very well. As John said earlier, it's much more of a psychological factor there. There's Wash uh, very nicely through the coffin there, really uh, keeping his balance, keeping the horse moving right through that combination and down over the drop. There's Wash over the water, over the rails. Ooh, just leaving a leg there. I think uh, Askaway was uh, really looking at the water rather than the rail, and uh, Wash was very good to, to check him back and uh, really keep him balanced. Here's one of our competitors from uh, the New England area, Susie Gunnell and Life O'Reilly. Susie's had a very, uh, very good year with uh, this particular horse. A couple of training events, and uh, nicely one striding through the coffin. I think most riders that uh, really come in and, and go aggressively over that ditch are the ones that are, are riding it the best because it uh, really gets the horses into that combination and gets them moving forward with impulsion. Yeah, nicely through the water there. And here we have Amity Bush and Sandpiper. Ooh, getting a little close there to the bullseye. 
but she's all right. Now she heads on towards the coffin at 7AB. She's clear there, and down to the water, she's stepping off, and a very nice strong ride through the water. Well, now we'll take you out to the preliminary cross country for the three-day competitors. I think it's entirely appropriate that this production is being called the Legend of Legend because the truth of the matter is that there are many legends at Legend and the one that's probably the most popular and the best known is the Legend of Bugali. And I have to go back a ways and explain to you that we're on a farm in New England and the most of the farms in New England uh, needed sand for making concrete and needed sand for building and needed sand to put on icy roads in the winter. And so wherever they could, they developed a sand pit. And we're standing right by the sand pit uh, that used to be used in the old days to provide sand for the various uses on the farm. Now, the Bugali part of it uh, all goes this way. Bugali is a friendly family ghost. And he goes back about five generations, I believe. And he lives in this sand pit all year long. He lives here 364 days of the year. On the 365th, which of course is Halloween, uh, Bugali comes out and he's been making candy all year and he spreads candy around the farm, the orange and black and white candy that you're all familiar with that the children eat and pull their teeth out on and so forth uh, at Halloween. Now, when my mother was alive, and my mother is Gramby and the lady referred to in this sign, she used to collect the youngsters of the neighborhood, anybody under 12, I think, would qualify, and they'd spend the greater part of the afternoon carving pumpkins to see who could design the best pumpkin, and they would bob for apples, and they'd duck for donuts, and they'd play the many other games that are associated with our traditional Halloween. And then towards darkness, mother would collect all of the children up at the top of the hill and feed them supper, and she'd feed them supper in the breakfast room, and the breakfast room had large windows that looked over the swimming pool, which was there at the time. And as the little monsters were sucking down their uh, cream chicken and, and ice cream and all, uh, Bugali, who was one of us older people, anyhow, had to be older, older than 12, uh, would creep up unseen by the darkness of night to the edge of the swimming pool and dump a bucket of gasoline on the pool. And then they would ignite the gasoline and all of a sudden there'd be this absolutely whew, huge, enormous frame, flame, and Bugali, who was dressed just in a simple bed sheet, would appear and disappear over the hill. Then mother would collect the children, there might have been 15 or 20 of them, I suppose, eating supper, all dressed up as cats and ghosts and uh, goblins and witches and any other costume that they happen to be wearing. And she'd take them out to the front porch of the house and issue them a little bitty flashlight. And she'd say, now, if you call to Bugali, Bugali will answer you. And she'd say, now, you press your light and you say, Bugali, Bugali, shine your light. So all the little children, little monsters, I like to call them, all the little monsters would press their lights and they'd say, Bugali, Bugali, shine your light. And Bugali, who by this time was maybe three or 400 yards away, would beep, beep, beep back on his flashlight. And then all of the children, and mind you, was completely and totally dark, would head across country, and they'd run into bushes, and they'd fall into ditches, and they'd trip over vines, and they'd run into stone walls. And they'd chase Bugali, and they'd chase Bugali, and they'd chase Bugali. And then when they got close enough, which might have been 100 or 150 yards away, and Bugali felt that he might get caught, Bugali would simply slip behind a bush or slip behind a tree and leave his sheet there. And uh, when the children got there, all that was left was the sheet. Well, needless to say, the little girl or the little boy 
who found the sheet was the hero or the heroine of the evening, and they'd all run back up to Gramby's, my mother's house, and she was quite an old lady at this time and quite crippled, and she was sitting there, and she would sit there in a chair, and whoever found the sheet would come up to Gramby and uh, tell her how, he'd, how he or how she had caught Bugali, and mother would listen attentively and ask questions and discover how the whole chase went, and then she would tear up these tear up the sheet into strips, much like the Beatles did the sheets in the old days, and then she'd hand each one of the children a strip of the sheet, and they would take this strip of sheet back with them and put it under their pillow, and that would guarantee the scariest dreams possible for just weeks and weeks and weeks to come. And the interesting thing is that whereas, as of many, many years ago, there were Santa Clauses on every street corner and on every television set, and in every department store, and on every corner, there's only one Bugali. And in the 40 years, the 45 years that I've known about Bugali, and this represents some five generations now of children, no child, after he reached the age of 12, ever told anybody younger than 12, any of the other children, that Bugali wasn't real. And so Bugali is one of the few uh, fictional characters uh, of Halloween that has remained uh, completely and entirely intact and there's only one of them and this is where he lives and we'll be doing the Bugali chase again this year uh, with youngsters and this has been an obstacle in the legend course ever since the beginning in fact I think if I were to go back to the first legend that I think this is probably the only obstacle that is in exactly the same place it's been built different ways. We've had steps into it and steps out of it, and we've had verticals in the middle, and we've had ditches at the top, and we've done every conceivable thing to change its format from year to year. Uh, but it is the oldest, uh, oldest obstacle on the legend course. Well, you know, uh, every event organizer will always tell you this jump isn't quite finished yet. And this jump isn't quite finished yet because when it's finished, it will have white beach sand in front of it. And it's known as the wave. And uh, the first wave that was ever built, to my knowledge, was built by John Dillon, who designed and built this course. And he did this at Punchestown two years ago. And he came here to work for me two years ago, the last time we had Ledger and built this wave and uh, now I think you'll find waves on virtually every course in the country at least I know seven different uh, seven different events that have waves but the painting here is quite unique and the painting was done by a friend of mine Pat Rule and she does all of the painting on the course she painted this she painted the uh, uh, buxom barmaid and the uh, tavern jump that I think you've already uh, filmed with John Dillon and she painted the wonderful pigs that are at Porky's Pen. And if we haven't uh, looked at those yet, we certainly will uh, later on. 
This happens to be a preliminary fence, and it's awesome when it's first uh, viewed by the competitors, but the truth of the matter is that in the several years that we've used it, it has never, uh, never caused a problem. They simply gallop on down and jump over it. This is the only wave, I think, in the country that is actually painted as a wave, and we may very well, before the event, and we're now only two, two days or one day before the event, put some lobster pots and some seaweed and so forth in front to decorate it up a bit, but I think that you're getting the, the picture of the thing. And uh, it's one of my favorite jumps, uh, because it's picturesque, because it's original, and because it comes from Ireland, and I'm one quarter Irish, so that makes me feel good about, good about it. Little boy, I used to come up here uh, to this area on Ledger Farm to pick blueberries to make Christmas money. And I can recall that if we picked a quarter of blueberries, they'd pay us, mother would pay us 25 cents for a quarter of blueberries. And that really has nothing to do with the jump that you are looking at, the obstacle that you're looking at. But I should tell you that my grandfather was in the patent medicine business and that one of his uh, most popular products was air sarsaparilla. It invigorated you in every conceivable way. It was good for almost everything and anything that was wrong with you. And interestingly enough, he put out a publication called Air's Almanac, which was identical in uh, shape and size and content to the old Farmer's Almanac. It had the phases of the moon and the times of the high tide and was filled with perfectly atrocious testimonials about what all the air products would do for you. And the air products sold all over the world and Air's Almanac was translated into seven different languages. And he reached the Indian country by scout and carried sarsaparilla and cathartic pills and ague cure and comatone and, and hair vigor and some of these other things in the uh, uh, pouches of the saddlebags. And he had a little store on the side wheelers that went up and down the Mississippi and sold his products that way. At any rate, uh, I was in New Orleans one time and saw painted on the side of a restaurant there a sign which substantially was exactly like the one you're looking at. It said, Air Sarsaparilla, once taken, never forsaken. And so I took this photograph, and this was way back in the early days when Horse Trials had no sponsorship. Lucky, luckily, this year we do. We have several uh, very helpful sponsors uh, providing, uh, providing us with the funds we need to build some of these fences. But for the first 10 years, it uh, all came out of either father's pocket or my pocket. So I always rather jokingly refer to this obstacle as the, uh, as the sponsor for the early days of legend. Here's Asprilla was a sponsor for the early days of legend, and it's not being used in the course this year, but I thought it was worth commenting about because that kind of tells you where it all came from. Good morning, my name is John Dillon, and um, we're at the Legend 90 uh, event course in Massachusetts, Hamilton. And um, this is, we're going to walk the uh, advanced track. This is the first fence, number one, the larch logs. Um, it's a good a sloping first fence with some flowers in front of it, very attractive, and it just encourages the horse to jump. And it's the, uh, it's just a very inviting first fence, very easy to jump. The advanced track, it's um, an oxa with um, some flowers in the front of it, as you can see. It's uh, a good advanced second fence. It's, it's pretty big. It's about uh, three foot nine, three foot ten high. Um, it's helping the horse again to stretch and get going, you know, really getting, getting carried out over the fence. Uh, we have some fl flowers in front of it and bark mulch to give them a takeoff line because it is very vertical and it's not too good to have too many vertical fences in the beginning of the course. The f first three to four fences um, and the beginning of the course should be ascending and very inviting and encourage the horse to jump and let him say to himself, well, this is going to be fun, let's go for it. So this is the second um, advanced. But three for the advanced, the sloping stone wall. 
It's just um, a traditional, really, New England hunting stone wall, really. Again, it's quite big, but there's a nice sloping front to it and very inviting to the horse. Um, the, fir the first one, two, three fences are not terribly close together. They've nice galloping, so by this stage, the horse is sort of starting to waken up and he's going, hmm, well, let's go for more. Um, the gallop onto the fourth fence is quite some ways, but that is the first test number four. Uh, this is fence number four for the advance. It's the Stockholm combination. Um, the idea came from the Stockholm fence, the road crossing in the World Championships this year in Sweden. It's not an identical... When we planned it out, we thought it would turn out just like it, but the ground is different, but it's still quite a testing fence. Uh, what they do is come down on this bank on, on um, section A, one stride down to B, one stride again to C. The straight through route, which as you can see, is straight down the middle. Um, with the wings at the side going away, it's quite hard because the front section is very narrow and it's looking for a run out if you're not in good control. Um, the option here is to pop off left or right of the bank and swing around and jump the wings either way as in an S or it's possible to do a one stride across it. It's uh, the first test on the advanced track and I think it's a good test. I think it's a good size fence. It's not too small, it's not too big. I think it's just about right. So I'd be glad to see some of this, how this rides. Fence five for the uh, advance, the Austrian bank. It's uh, not a particularly hard fence, but I think it's quite a good test. As you come down off the combination, fence four A, B, C, and then turn in to the Austrian bank. All you do is just run up it and there's a ditch on the far side that you jump out and they'll land way out the far side and um, this fence has been here for many, many years and it's always ridden well. And then they head up then and they gallop up the hill to the tavern. Six on the advanced track is the Fairlawn Tavern. It's basically a picture frame really but uh, a rather nicely dressed up picture frame. It's the image of a, of a pub really of some sort. The, um, this would be, how would you say, and a sort of an ascending, an ascending fence. It would be something like the same principle as the first fence, a triple bar, an ascending thing. You've got your ground line here, your middle rail and your back rail. And it always jumps very well. Um, it's not too big because they have had a hell of a pull up the hill from the Austrian bank. And um, they always fly over this very well. And it's, it always jumps well because the horse is jumping out into daylight as opposed to into darkness. And these kind of fences always jump great. This is fence seven for the advanced. It's uh, a Chatsworth, they call it. The, uh, as opposed to, there was a fence down in Chatsworth, Georgia, just like this, that Neil and I thought it was a nice fence to build. It replaces the old notorious Ledged Farm hay rack, which was in this field for so many years. We thought it served its purpose now and we're going to put something new. The, up, the uh, main route is to over the V, or you jump down a panel, turn right-handed and jump, jump up a panel. Um, this would be a good example of the way we're thinking of the one-day advanced horse trials, not building it too big, because this is not a big advanced fence. Um, it looks very pretty and it's very long, but dimension-wise and difficulty it's not, and I would suspect a lot of them will take the V because we didn't want to build too hard a fence. Like I say, with the one day, you won't get the cream of the crop. The panel is just basically a trachea over a log over a ditch, and uh, otherwise known as a trachea. The panel in underneath that makes it that bit easier because it looks a lot more solid than it is. If the log wasn't, if the panel wasn't there, it would be look a tremendous big fence. It's one of the biggest fences on the course, on the advanced track, and again. This always jumps well. Number nine on the advanced course is the water complex, which is always a nice, you can always do some wonderful things at water complexes. Um, it's, I haven't seen many of them, but it's an A, B, C, D, and E, which you don't see many of, really. Uh, this year, they jump panel A, turn left-handed, jump B, a one stride, and jump C, through the water, jump out, D, turn right-handed, and jump element E. So it's quite a lot of jumping efforts. 
We've changed it from 88. It was a bounce in in 88. And it was a tough fence in 88 for the three day. And again, on the principle it being an advanced horse trials, we don't want to wipe everyone out at the water. So I moved it back to a one stride and I've slowed them down as well. They have to jump the panel, slow down, jump a panel. They have an option on element C, instead of doing the one stride in, they can jump. There's an element on the far side. On the right of element C, they can pop in over a small rail. It's a bit slower, but if no one wants to do the one stride or they refuse at the first element, this is, this is all rebuilt this summer. 10 for the, for the advanced. Um, between the water fence, nine, and the next fence, the, court, the saw table, which was 11, it was a hell of a long gallop. And I wanted to put something in along here just to give them something to jump and not let them go too mad. Um, and then I came up with this idea of a, a steeplechase fence. Um, they've always jumped well. It's a, it's a good sized steeplechase fence, no doubt. Um, and I built it on the principle of the ones like at home as a steeplechase fence, and these things always jump well. They come around the corner, they're going on well, and they just kick on and they fly over it. And there's about um, a four foot, four foot six takeoff skirt in front of it. With the orange rail, it's good because it gives a bit of color to the fence for attractiveness, plus um, the different shade, the horse will know when to take off because it's been in the woods. Um, and by the way, this is a portable fence. I can lift it out of the way very easily with a machine. Saw, saw table or picnic table, whatever you want to call it. Um, this would be about a maximum height fence for the, for the advanced. And again, this year, with the horse trials in mind, we decided to put um, a takeoff rail, a little bench in front of it, just to make it that more a bit inviting and a bit easier, like again, for the not so good advanced horses. And um, again, this always jumps well. It's a good size spread, without a doubt, but it always jumps well. 12 for the uh, advanced. It's called a scallop fence because it's, it's in the shape of two big scalloped uh, loops as such, or whatever you want to call it. And this is a pretty big fence for the advanced. We put the takeoff rail on it because with the ditch in front of it, a horse could possibly get in under it too much and there's no way he's going to jump that from down there. So it makes it a lot easier with the takeoff rail here. Plus, again, for the horse, for the advanced horse trials, it just helps them a bit better. And um, again, this always jumps well, especially since we put the takeoff rail on it. It looks humongous, but it always jumps well. Number fence, fence 13 for the advanced is the notorious ledgered coffin. Um, I've been told it was one of the first coffins ever in America. Um, originally came from England. Neil brought the idea over from England. Um, years, and years ago, originally it caused some terrible problems because no one had ever seen anything like this before. But over the years, a lot of coffins have popped up everywhere and people are getting the knack of riding them now. Um, on this, there's an A, B and the C. The A would be these panels here, come down the hill, jump element B, the ditch, run up the hill and jump out over the element C. We rebuilt this back in 86 because it was falling to part and um, so it's still holding up well and I think everyone's really got the knack of it. I think the uh, new people coming advanced to Ledger that have just moved up to advance might be a bit worried about this but generally people have got the knack for riding this cuff and, and it usually goes well. Number 14 for the advance is the ski jump. Again this is a, another well-known Ledger um, fence. It's been here for many years and it's again, as far as I can remember, it's always originally caused a few problems. What you've got is you come down a quite a big drop, four to five strides to a, a vertical brush box at the bottom of it. Um, again, I think the trick is not to jump down too big off the drop, check back and pop down off the drop, gather yourself, get your, the, your striding right and pop over the hedge. If it's ridden right, it goes very well. This is fence, the second last for the, inter, for the advanced. It's um, number 16. And we're calling it like the dock or the mound. Um, we've, we just built this fence this summer. 
It's something different looking and uh, it's quite small frontage and it's quite wide on the top and um, it's just the second last, it's just a sort of a bank sort of a effort. Um, it's still testing enough because it's quite narrow and it just needs a bit of control to jump it and um, it's big enough to be banked but it's still a good spread on top of it. So it's just thought of like um, an ox or of some sort on the way home. Ants fence on the course. It's, we call it the pumpkin patch of sort. It's just a very attractive last fence. Again, it's not too small because you don't want it to be too small because if you have the last couple of fences too small as opposed like number 16 is quite a big fence, you need to keep the riders alert and awake and not have too small fences at the end because they, if they're too small they don't pay attention to them and that's when problems happen. Again, this is just like the first fence in a sense. It's very inviting, colourful and it's just a nice reward for the horses on the way home. And here we are on the Speed and Endurance Day. We've got a lot to cover here. Uh, we have anywhere from novice all the way up through the advanced horse trials. <laughs> I think I've been spotted. We're going to start the coverage first with the novice cross country. And these are the teams now on the course. From Farewell Farm, Laura Poston and Espresso as they head out to the first. And they're clear there. This team, the Farewell Farm team, are uh, currently in second place after dressage. And a uh, note here that there are only uh, just about 10 and a half points between first and third place in the team standings, so a very close competition. And Laura starts out a good cross country for her team. She has cleared over the rails there on the front part of the course as she winds her way through the woods. And uh, getting a little tight there on uh, 5B, the second part of the combination, but she's all right to this point. Here we have Lisa Roebling and Nemesis for the Area 8 team. This is the team currently in the lead. They have a total team uh, standing right now of 101.4. And Lisa and Nemesis had the best individual dressage score out of all the team members. And they brought home a score of 28.8, so a very, very good start for this team and for this particular rider. And she's clear at the first. And on into the water now, we see it from another angle. And very well done there. And 180 turn, and back to the open ditch. It's fun because there's a lot of uh, rivalry between the Area 3 or the Farewell Farm team and the Area 8 team because a lot of these riders uh, compete at the same events down in the Kentucky and Tennessee Valley area and, and in North and South Carolina. So a lot of good friends on two teams, but uh, there's a lot of rivalry here. I think there's uh, a lot of honor in uh, and who's going to take home the blue here in the adult team championships? Fifty-seven. Yeah, here we have someone that's uh, just a little tentative in the water there, but okay. And she makes a turn now, now into the ditch at 10. Here we have Dominic Bergen and BJ's Diamond Lil from the host Area 1 Gold Diggers team. They are currently tied for third. 
A score of 112.8 after the dressage. Of course, in the team uh, competition, it's just like they do at the World Championships that, or, the, or the Olympics. They take the top three scores of each phase of competition. Diamond Lil now there over the wall. Here we have Robbie Moon and Scamp, another one of the uh, members from the Area 8 team. And they've already had a clear round so far with the first rider. So they're really putting the pressure on all of the other competitors, those uh, second and third place teams. And nicely over the first. Okay, somebody else already picked him up. And yeah, through the water, and a big jump there over the open 71. ditch. And Scamp very nicely through the in and out at 5A and B. There's the backside of the wave that you heard Neil talk about earlier. So you can see that the horses are really going to have to pay attention there because there is a, a slight drop on the landing as those horses come down that hill. Here's Dining Car, ridden by Kingman Peniman for the Tony's Ponies team. They are also from Area 1, currently in eighth place after day one. And Dining Car cleared the first. Here's Scamp into the water. Ooh, and standing way off, almost catching a back leg there. She really had to, uh, to bring herself back and get collected there to make the turn. She almost uh, went around the training rails there. So she's got her balance back. Scamp uh, knows his business, and a nice big jump over the ditch. Got a great attitude, just ears pricked right forward. He really knows what he's doing. He says, where's the next one? Let's get right to it. Here's Dining Car into the water. Very strong ride there, nicely done. You can see the crowd there uh, starting to assemble on different parts of the course as they get ready for the higher divisions later on this morning. And of course, uh, in the afternoon, we, we finish up with the advanced horse trials, and then we have the training teams at the end of the day. There's the commander in chief with uh, John Strasberger from the Chronicle of the Horse. The Chronicle, one of the major sponsors of the team championships for the adult regions are here on the East Coast. And some last minute uh, checks on the course there. Well, as we said earlier, we have a lot going on. Now back over at Flying Horse, we have dismantled the, uh, the dressage areas. All right, you see uh, some of them being dismantled actually there. And we are now underway with the second phase of the preliminary three-day speed and endurance day. These riders have started out with Phase A, the roads and tracks, and now they're here over this beautifully, beautifully manicured steeplechase course on the Pingree Farm at Flying Horse. This is one of the very few natural steeplechase courses in the country for three-day eventing. There's Ann Getchell and Lorenzo. Checks her watch and canters on, make sure her time's all right. After the riders leave here, the end of phase B, they'll go out on the second roads and tracks, which will take them back through Hamilton and Wenham. And uh, what's uh, very interesting about Ledyard is they use the entire area, including the roads and crossings between the two towns. Now, we mentioned earlier about how important safety is. And 
the veterinary inspections. Now here the riders come into the vet box right after the, the second roads and tracks. And here's Bruce Davidson in the Eagle Lion, first of two rides he'll have here in the preliminary division. Now he's in the box here, he's got 10 minutes, make sure all his equipment's checked, make sure the horse is okay, he's fit enough to go on, he gets the okay from the vets, and now he's out on the course. And here's Bruce down through the Bugali pit. And up over the bank and the logs. And on to the Chatsworth rails, jumping the right hand side and down to the big natural hedge. Quite a formidable jump because it has about a two or three foot uh, drop on the landing there, and uh, that's about four foot wide across the top. Now here's Bruce coming to the preliminary water. This gets rails, one stride, rails into the water, and then out over the little bank. And Bruce handles that with no problem at all. And over the big trichina log, Bruce opts for the right-hand side, which has the big ground rail, kind of uh, hides part of that ditch there. It's providing riders and horses with a better line there over that particular combination. And up over the rails. And here we have Ann back in the vet box. She's uh, been clear on the cross country so far. No faults on the steeplechase. Over the roads and tracks. A little drink of water. I'm just going to find out what his vitals were when he came over. And how was it on steeplechase? Quick. I never had more fun in my life. I didn't know what to expect, but it was great. Three, two, Goes back to check her horse out again. Then nice she'll be on the cross country. She gets the countdown, and there she goes, out on phase D. Two, two, eight. Four minutes. Two, two, eight. Four minutes. Have a good day. Bye. through the Bugali pit and out over the logs. Nicely done. And we have another rider in the vet box here, Beth Murphy with Zebedee. And you can see all of her uh, crew members, just like a pit crew at the Indy 500 here, working together as a unit, trying to cool this horse down, getting the towels on, the vet checking the pulse and respiration. So, uh, he's puffing just a little bit there. Cool him down there. Okay, what's going on? Well, I just had a really good go. My horse is feeling fine, but he ripped off one shoe and he sprung half the nails on the other. We couldn't get the easy boot on, so we had to just wait till he pulled it off himself. So now we got to get two shoes on him right now. So I came in five minutes early so I could get them on without having a crunch of time. How was steeplechase? It was great. That's where I ripped the shoes off, though, so somewhere my shoes are out there. Some do, some don't. And here's Anne as she makes her way to the water. Anne was tied for ninth after dressage, and uh, she has uh, done a great job so far on the cross country. No faults to this point. She is clear through the water, nicely done. She's about halfway through the course at this point. Here's Judy Rosenthal and Cambrian. She was fourth after the dressage. She heads down to the Bugali pit, bouncing down in, and one striding out over the logs. Big jump over Weldon's wall. That has about a four-foot ditch in front of it. The ditch is about three or four feet deep, and that's a, that's a big jump there for the preliminary riders. And a big one stride in, and nicely out over the bank. Clear through the water there at 
Oh, now here we have our first refusal on a coverage so far on the cross country. It looks as though uh, Judy didn't quite pick the right line. She was a little bit too close to the tree there. That fence is uh, is formed in a in a V shape, and I think she just got a little bit off the line there. Her horse uh, was a little bit unsure of what to do there. He knew that the ditch. He could see the ditch was there, and. Uh, she brings him back around and straightens him into that uh, that right-hand side a little bit better this time. How's everything going? Just fine. How does steeplechase go? Super. And how's your how's your baby doing? Good. Anything you've got particular interest in on phase D? Hmm? Anything you have particular interest in in phase D? No, I think that um, everything seems pretty fair and straightforward. It's just a matter of getting getting there. I'm sorry, Carol. Have a good She just took it. Okay, what are what are the vets saying now? They haven't touched her yet. You're coming up second. You've got six. Should I go weasel or die? The vets are over there. Five, four, three. And Darren's been cleared by the vets. Go. And here he is on phase D. Horse looks uh, rested and relaxed and ready to go. And a nice jump over the first. Nice ride through the water there for Zebedee. Beth Murphy. And Darren. Oh, um, oh, Darren was very lucky there. Good piece of riding. Right. You can see that he almost went off the bank there to the right of the flag. Now, if he'd done that and not, not gotten through that set of flags there, he would have picked up those 20 faults for refusing. But he was very clever. He really kept the horse bent to the left there and jerked him around, made him go off that bank. And uh, he's clear through that combination. That was a very close call. Here's Darren as he makes his way down to the Chatsworth rails. Clear at six. Nicely there. Big jump there, left hand turn down to the big natural hedge at seven. And on down to the big steeplechase hedge. Getting in a little close there, but he's all right. And here's Darren making his way to the water. Over the rails, one striding in, nicely done there, and out over the bank. Heads up, folks. On down to the water at it's always important Darren, to spectators. Seven, Clear those penalty eight, zones and galloping five, lanes. It's uh, very dangerous if uh, people two, don't uh, pay attention one, all the time to what's go, going on. These horses and riders are moving at a fairly good rate of speed. Here we have one of our international competitors from Canada. Another rider who was at the World Championships. This is Nick Holmes Smith and Rudapest. He's currently in second place as he goes out on the course. He's been cleared by the vets in the box. And there he is now over the first. Down to the Bugali pit. Oh, a little scramble there. A little bit uh, too fast going into the first part there. Rudapest wasn't quite sure where to put his feet, but they're all right. Makes the turn now. To Weldon's wall. A nice big jump there for Rudapest. And on to the water complex. Standing back over the rails. No trouble. Clear through the water for Nick Holmes Smith and Rudapest. Two five, eight, eight. 
Well, here we have the current leader. He's finished his steeplechase and his two sets of roads and tracks. He hasn't uh, picked up any penalties so far. Bruce Davidson with the wolf. Final check here to make sure everything is set and ready to go. There's the vet. Picking pulse and respiration. Bruce checks his watch and now he's on the course. And Bruce has already been around the course earlier today. So he has a feel for the combinations, for the footing. Knows where he has to check back, where to drive on. And he is clear over the first. Down through the Bugali pit. Double sets of banks, nicely done there. Over the bank, and then over the logs. And here's Bruce on his way to the water again. His second trip there today in the three-day division. Nicely over the rails. A little hesitation there, but okay. And he's about halfway through now. And here's Bruce uh, making a fairly wide turn to the Tricana, and he's going to go for the right-hand side there, right by the tree. Nicely done. Uh, most of the riders uh, who took that uh, line uh, accomplished that jump a lot better than those who uh, tried the left-hand side there. There, there's Bruce over the wave at 15. And now he comes to the Normandy bank. Up on the bank, it's a ditch on the back side there. He is clear, and now on to the uh, Stonewall Oxer. Two more to go. And Bruce is clear there, and on to the last. And in fact, it turned out that Bruce did go clear, uh, so he takes that lead to the show jumping tomorrow. Well, let's go now and uh, meet one of our celebrities here, Captain Mark Phillips from Great Britain. Yeah, when I first um, came to Ledyard in, I think it was 1971, I came and judged here. And then I came and rode here in 73, and. 75, and uh, and then since then, uh, of course, come across Neil a lot as a as a course designer in other parts of the world. And um, when you uh, when you rode here in 73 and 75, was it the same or more difficult, or how uh, um, how is Ledyard viewed in the uh, the uh, what? In, um, in 70, 73 and 75, it would be um, what was we now call a two-star CCI, so it was an advanced class international uh, three-day event. And uh, this fence was here, <laughs> and uh, I, got, I got eliminated here at the, at the coffin um, in 75 uh, on a horse called Laureate. And uh, he got it, had his tongue over the bit, and uh, effectively it meant I lost a lot of c control, and he came here and he said, no, thank you very much. And, um, there's a long way to come to get eliminated, but uh, that was the way of it. <laughs> uh, uh, I think the, I mean, I know I do a lot of course designing around the world myself, as I'm not doing so much riding these days. Right. And uh, I think the trend is, is going more and more to the, the fences that need accuracy and control by the rider, rather than just the great big fence that people can hool down to and hope the fences are going to back off, hope the horses are going to back off and, and, and jump it. And uh, I think that as a trend is coming in more, more and more because that way, if the, um, if the riders don't get it right, the horse has a glance off or a stop and, uh, and no, nobody gets hurt. And, um, sometimes you have the very big fences, you, know, you get a horse upside down in the middle of them. And uh, I think the sort of course designers now are trying to steer more and more away from that type of fence. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think the... Um, the advanced course here is, is a lovely course. It's um, you know, very, in the main, certainly, it's very inviting, very encouraging, beautifully built. Uh, I think the, the two serious fences on the, on the course, uh, one is the water, and the other is here at the, at, at the coffin. Um, the jumping planks like this into a coffin is never an easy thing to, to do. I think as a rider, you'd always rather have a, a material that had a a more rounded surface on, on the top. And uh, as far as the water jump is concerned, there it's a very difficult to get a line through the, the fence to jump it, um, to jump it quickly. Uh, so I think we're going to see uh, a lot of people <laughs> twisting and turning and ducking and diving uh, there. Plus the, the, the distance between the two sets of rails actually into the water itself is quite long. Uh, so. Um, 
I think we'll see riders endeavouring to, to come at it quite strongly to get one stride in and uh, one or two of the horses thinking better of it and putting a, a second stride in. Okay. Coming back to this coffin then, how would you uh, ride it given the uh, opportunity to do so tomorrow? Yeah, well, luckily I've got uh, <laughs> too old and fat to ride <laughs> this type of fence now. But the, uh, actually, there is, a, there is a, um, um, a slightly easier place, given that we're coming up the, coming up the hill to it. Uh, the uh, one to the third panel up from the, from the left-hand side uh, is a little smaller, and you can jump it slightly uphill, which makes it easier for the, uh, for the horse. And then you've just got to straighten yourself up to jump the, the little parallel bar at in the bottom, but that'll be quite an effort for the horses to, to, to jump that, and then they should um, come up the hill and jump out no trouble at all. And uh, any tricks to the water that you could see that you would do? How would you go? Because uh, I, I, I think to get a, a direct line through, for me anyway, is too difficult. I, I don't think the... Um, uh, I haven't, um, well, haven't had for a long time a horse that would be good enough to, to do that. I think... Um, I'd be very surprised if, if anybody tries that. I think they'll all try a more circuitous route in the first first half of the of the water, uh, and then they'll come out come out the quick one. The the, um, the only reason that that, <coughs> that England's maybe the, the mecca of, of horse trials is that the um, we've got so many many opportunities to compete there, and every time we compete. We're always competing against many of the top riders in the in the world. Um, I think over here in America, you've got uh, probably, if not as many, you've got there's a number of very good good courses, but the people don't get the opportunity to compete so often um, over those good courses. And when they compete, they're t tending to compete more just against people here in North America. Whereas in England, we've got people from Europe and not only New Zealanders and in fact, now a lot of Americans over there as, uh, as well. So the, uh, the the level of competition there is, is is very high, and you can go to a one-day event there, uh, a horse trials there, and they do a, a real nice test and go fast across country, jump a clear around show jumping, go to the scoreboard and find your tenth or twelfth because of the simply because of the standard of the of the field. And of course, that that's. A very good exercise in honing your your competition skills and to make you really sharp before you go to the next competition. Well, here we are on the advanced cross country course. Now we have Nancy Guyot and Shelburne going down through the Stockholm combination there at four A, B, and C. Very nicely done. You can see how the horses have to really check back coming down that hill to get those short strides in between the two rails there. Nancy's hitting a nice stride on the back of the course here, onto the big trichina log. Nicely done there. Now she heads on to water. This is a previous uh, United States Combined Training Association Horse of the Year in 1988. And uh, now Nancy negotiates the water complex. And these riders uh, have five elements here. They've got a tight uh, turn, then you go through the water, and then a tight turn out. So you have elements A through E here. Well done, Nancy Guy out through the water. She looks at her watch. Riders have to be very careful at this complex about where the penalty zone is. That zone that surrounds the fence is uh, very tightly measured there, so riders have to make sure they stay in when they make that turn. Here's Julie and Ballyhack down through the Stockholm. Short stride, nicely done there. Julie uh, really kept him together. Now she heads on uh, to the Irish Bank. On a little bit deceiving there in the picture because there's about a four or five foot ditch on the bottom there on, on the back side of that bank. And nicely through the tavern. And here's Nancy going through the famous ledgered coffin. Little bit short there. Ooh, almost coming off. Uh, hanging leg there on the last. That's always been uh, the toughest part of the jump, uh, uh, where the riders have to take one stride or two strides. That, uh, At the water is Julie Gamina on the English bred ballet hack for me. Jumping very well over 9A, well organized. This is a uh, horse doing his second advance since being owned by Julie very neatly in the water, very well out, very well through the water. Well done. And here she comes to the coffin over the rails. 
Of the plank there, over the ditch, little, no oh, she lost impulsion, there, there she popped off there. She did, she lost impulsion over the ditch, and she had to put almost two, to about two and a half little strides in there going up that hill. It's very deceiving, because you really have to push those horses on up that hill so they get out over the vertical. Both horse and rider okay here, and Julie's popped back in the saddle and she'll continue on, but unfortunately, she's gonna pick up 60 faults there for that fall. Next comes Susie Jackson, Jackson from California, riding a lovely chestnut horse. Jumps a little tight, takes, still takes the one stride of water. Two strides out, very well done. Horse very boldly through the water. And here she comes to the saw table. Now this combination uh, last year was very tight in that it had a big log pile that was, that was set at a right angle to that table. So Neil has lessened the severity of that jump by just uh, making the riders jump the one element there. Now that table is still formidable. It's about uh, four and a half feet across the top there. And Susan to the coffin. A big jump over the ditch. Now here she loses momentum. And exact same thing that happened to Julie. She got in there a little too tight, did not have enough oomph to get out over the panels there, and she picks up the 60 faults there. And uh, both horse and rider okay. She's quickly back in the saddle and continuing on. Here's Karen Lendy and Park Hall. They're currently in second place. And nicely through the Stockholm combination and on to the Irish Bank. And over the ditch. Little hesitation there, but she's okay. No faults. Onto the big trichina log on the back of the course. She's clear there and onto the water. The, this is the gray park hall. The entry of Mr. Mrs. Richard Thompson, ridden by Karen Lendy, being very cautious to A, very tight to A. Another turn you can see from these riders who have been riding at the advance while, for a while. Very tight in, still done it in one stride. Nicely jumped out. And nice round turn over the last. Here's Charlie Plum and Landino. Comes down to the Stockholm fence. Looking down over the drop, a little tight in there. He's okay. Nicely through the, the in and out and the B and C elements. On the bank. And a big jump there for Charlie onto the back side of the Irish bank. Through the tavern. Here's Karen. Through the coffin. One, two. And nicely done. Two strides on the out there. You can see uh, how she uh, drove him up that hill and she uh, made him jump. Uh, Here comes the entry of Charles Plum Landino. Very nice turn, maintaining a very big effort over 9A, take, taking a longer approach. Unfortunately, probably out of the penalty zone. That is the penalty zone. Whoa! Occurring a fall. Uh, horse is loose. Rider's up. Everybody's all right. Reapproaches the fence. So he's having uh, just a little bit of uh, difficulty here. Looks like Landino is putting up a good little fight with him here. That tail's twitching, and uh, Charlie really has to, uh, to bring him together, jump that uh, the table there in the woods. And here he comes to the coffin over the first panel. Down of the big ditch, one, two, strides and nicely out. Oh, 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 oh. 
ski ramp and the brush. Here's Courtney Ramsey in stateside. He is currently in 10th place. He very wisely checks back, comes down to a trot. Yeah. And handles the uh, Stockholm combination with no trouble at all. On to the Irish bank. On the top. And out over the backside there. On to the big Trikana log. A nice big jump there. Horses in a very nice stride. He heads on to the water complex. One strike, oop, hanging a little leg going in there. He had to make a fairly good effort on the out and over the rails. Quickly and very wisely stayed balanced there. Kept himself over the center. Now here's Ralph Hill in freeway. He comes down to the Stockholm. He's jumping the left-hand side and, oh, uh, oh, that's a nasty fall there. He uh, really uh, hung a leg there. Freeway uh, really close, caught his right shoulder on the second element, on the B element. Actually, Ralph looks like he's uh, really shaking up here. That was uh, quite a nasty fall there. The horse was really twisting. Not sure whether the horse really came down on him or not. Ralph seems to be holding his uh, shoulder there. And in fact, there's Neil Air right there. To see, make sure Ralph's okay. Fence judges and all the officials right there. Yeah, Ralph is uh, kind of moving that right shoulder there just a little bit. Horse seems to be fine. He's caught standing right there. Well, it looks like Ralph is, uh, is going to continue on. Pop him back in the saddle now. Now remember, he's jumped the first two elements, so he has the option of going back to jump all three elements if he wants, or uh, just the element that he has missed, which is just the C element. He's going to go all the way back up the hill now. And he's going to attempt the whole thing. Down over the bank, short striding. And much better there. You can see really uh, how Ralph is uh, trying to hold that right shoulder as still as possible. Looks as though he uh, he may have injured that. In that fall. He's okay now, he's continuing on. And over the tavern. water. Aladdin's magic at Danny Joe Martinez, clear at seven. Now Bill heading to the jump in. Ooh, putting in a little short stride there. He really has to turn right here. It was not to miss that E element. But all right. And clear through the water complex. And here's Courtney. Talking, two strides up. Left to right line there. Oh, the ski ramp. Drop down. It's a big drop there, about six, seven feet. And over the big brush. Here's David O'Connor riding the Magic Dragon. Real good form there through the stock home combination at four. Big jump up and off the bank. He's doing a fairly good job here uh, for catch ride. A little uh, extra encouragement there over the big Tricana log. The horse was the 1988 Appaloosa Horse of the Year. Torrance heading to the, to the table. Goes through the water complex now, over the rails. And opting right for the post there at the E element. He's okay. And the Dragon just looking a little bit tired here towards the end of the course. But he's still uh, jumping well. And here's Ralph through the coffin. One, two, two strides here on the out. About uh, four fences from home now. And here's the current leader, Bruce Davidson and Mystic Hazard. He comes back down very, very carefully to the Stockholm fence. 
clear there at 4 ABC. Out to the Irish Bank. And clear out over the back side. Yeah, nicely over the tavern. is clear to water. Here's David coming to the table. Small table. And clear there. So we have two riders now from uh, the World Championships, members of the U.S. squad on the course. Here's David. Getting about three strides there. Uh, you can really see how uh, Magic Dragon is uh, Really tired here towards the end. Uh, they really had to, to drive him up that hill, get him over the vertical. And Bruce over the table. And onto the coffin. With the panels. Big jump over the ditch. And very nicely, he's striding out there. Well, you can see the great crowd assembled here at Ledger to watch the cross country. And uh, we've wrapped up the advanced division now. And we'll finish off the coverage with our training divisions. These are the training teams now underway. And they are the last series of competitors to go on the cross country course today. We had over, uh, over 300 entries and probably ran almost 290 of them uh, when it finally came down to the competition. And over the coffin there, over the ditch and rails. Left hand turn for the bank down. And that's over the open ditch. Here's Sheila Mueller and Royal Optimist. And nicely through the bullseye. Look at the ditch. Drive on. Ah, that was nicely done. She's got a little left behind, but she's all right. That uh, fence has caused some problems in the training divisions. Oops. Sit down, drive down over that bank. I think she's still okay there. And that coffin has caused the problems with horses uh, coming in and looking at that ditch and not really seeing the rails at the top of the hill there. So uh, riders really have to make sure to keep the horses together. A look at the water complex there. And here's Debbie Dean and Relentless Smoke from the Huntington Farm team. Through the bullseye. There's Debbie to the coffin, over the ditch, and vertical. And down over the bank. Up the vertical. And uh, through the water. 338. Over the curved brush there. And two more to go. Debbie to the water, over the rails, and a big jump in, and out over the bank. Over 
Very fresh. Pat on the neck as she heads towards the finish. Well, once again, there's the commander in chief. The man has put all of this fantastic competition and logistics and everything together and has done such a marvelous job, Mr. Neil Ayer. With uh, John Strasberger from the Chronicle of the Horse, one of the corporate sponsors here of the weekend of the Adult Team Championships. Here we are on the final day now, the show jumping or stadium jumping. We have two courses today, one for the training and novice, and the other for the preliminary three-day riders and the advanced. There's a lot happening on a show jumping day. We have the trade fair, riders making their final decisions. We have an exciting final day of competition for you. you you've been involved with the Ledyard event since its inception in some way, shape, or form. That's not, that is not so, right? Correct, yes. Okay. Very much so. Tell us a little bit of something about how it all began. Well, I think it began when Neil was uh, president of the USCTA, and I took my job as coach about the same time. Well, we obviously had a common interest in the success of both organizations, and mainly for one good reason, for the sport and for the, the team success. One of the first very important events that took place at Ledyard was, uh, I guess, in 1973, when uh, Neil came to me and said, uh, well, it's hard to send the riders always abroad. How about if we did organize an international? And I said, that's a genius idea. And uh, Neil, having not done that, asked if I would help, you know, with designing the course and dealing with the uh, international teams and so forth and so on and it was a very successful event uh, it was repeated again twice after that and i think that really helped fantastically the the sport in this country ledyard got on the map as a, basically as a model event for the country and I think a lot of the foreign riders were very impressed. You know how Neil is particular on the, on details and all that, and certainly he put his best foot forward all along, and everybody was very impressed, starting with me. <laughs> so it was a really, it, it was an example, you know, on how to run an event, and the courses were beautiful, and. And I would say he set up the standards right there. And uh, I think everybody tried to copy it, some successfully, some not quite as successful. But that was a wonderful way to go. So in other words, it set the standard for eventing in the United States. I think so, definitely. So now Ledyard 90, how does Ledyard 90 reflect back on Ledyard the International back in 75? Well, I think it's a different thing because in fact, Neil achieved what uh, had to be achieved, which was to bring international, not only flavor, but reality of eventing in this country. So now that it is a fact, I think what he did this year was run an event for the people. And I think it was a phenomenal to me uh, occasion because he ran so many divisions, gave it a chance to all the people who are interested in the sport to ride at Ledyard. You know, everybody dreams to ride at Ledyard. And it was absolutely very nice to see all the novice people and the training people doing just that and enjoying being, they can have their pictures and say, look, I rode at Ledyard, you know? And I think a lot of people like that. And uh, there were 360 horses or something like that, and uh, logistics were extremely difficult, but somehow it all works out. And uh, I think it was great, you know, the weather was phenomenal as well, as you can see, because we're still in it now. And uh, I think it was 
was a very successful event, and every rider is very grateful to Neil. Well, you're a little modest to mention this, but um, this event is dedicated to you, to your dedication to American eventing, and to eventing in general. Are, aren't you thrilled about that, Jack? Well, I am. I don't know if I deserve all the credit that I was given, but once you're in the, the water, you've got to swim. So <laughs> I have only one choice, but be accepting the fact. And uh, actually, yes, I am proud of it. Yes. It certainly was a very touching thing. Neil had all the international riders who rode for me in the last 20 some years. Uh, had a wonderful dinner party and was really phenomenal. And uh, so it was fun. Um, as I said, I think they had the wrong customer because the one who should be honored was Neil. And uh, anyway, it was very nice of him. Well, Neil was honored by having all his friends here and yes. having you here especially. Well, Please enjoy eventing. Well, it depends on how they are treated. I do believe that, you know, if you turn horses out in a pasture, I'm told that some of them go and jump a cross-country fence on their own. I have never seen it myself. Uh, so, but I think if they are well-trained, well-prepared, and well-treated, you know, they are not, if they are trained gently and uh, work with their brain instead of always getting on their body, I think the the horses go. I think they, they enjoy it. I don't know, but they show up pretty willing to do it. You know, you can see their face and they're happy. You know, they, there's a lot of excitement and stuff. Uh, on another hand, you can see horses ridden hard. You know, a bit schooled hard and by people who are more concerned about their own success than the well-being of their, of their horses. And you can see those horses having not a smile on their face. And uh, those don't enjoy it, I'm sure. <laughs> Encapsulated, what's the, what's the Le Goff theory of training? Simple statement, what's your point of view? My horse? point of view is I treat horses like intelligent animals versus a lot of people who think horses are dumb. They are dumb horses like dumb people. But overall, I think you have to try to think like they do because you cannot make them think like we do. So we're supposed to be smarter than they are. And I think if you approach that this way and you start thinking like a horse and you, you train them by addressing yourself to their understanding rather than imposing, I think you get better results. Okay, Jim. This is um, Easter Parade. Um, he's an eight-year-old English thoroughbred. I call him Rosie. Um, the lady I got him from, um, her name was Rosie, and I agreed to call this horse Rosie as she sold him to me. Anyway, he's my advanced horse. He's done um, one CCI. He did Kentucky in the spring of 90 on three other advanced screening trials for the world championships. He jumped everything clean and bold. He's very good, aren't you? Anyway, um, as um, the story of this sport goes for many of us, um, I drove, oh, 20 plus hours to Ledyard. Got off the van and Rosie had a sore foot. It's worked out to be something very minor. It was really a stone bruise, um, a bruised heel. The vets confirmed that. Um, make a long story short, I had options. He's a mean horse, isn't he? He's my, he's my friend. Um, options to try to go ahead and run him on dressage day because the sand, uh, it was a sand arena, and maybe I could have held him up and camouflaged his soreness. Or the other option was just to just let it be. And as it goes, I went ahead and um, warmed him up, and he was maybe presentable. Um, had some of my friends um, and colleagues look at him and some said he could get away with it, others said he wouldn't get away with it. What? So anyway, I uh, decided not to run him. I withdrew, you know, as I was next to go into the arena. And 
I'm glad I did that. He's a, a good horse, he's a young horse, and I think he's got a future um, in this sport, barring any other unsoundnesses or long range unsoundnesses. But I guess we're both living right because Saturday night um, after the cross country, um, of course he didn't run, but the um, bruise did work to an abscess, came out the bulb of the heel with my vet's assistance, and now we sound, the shoe is back on, and we hope to still compete at Fair Hill, which is in uh, three weeks. These are athletes like we are, and when you're competing, one of these athletes, um, it takes literally months and years to, to bring them to peak, um, if, to develop a bond, a relationship, as you can see. It sounds corny, but it's real. You know, you have to know them mentally. They have to know you and respect you and believe what you're about. Um, they need to be very sound physically. <clears throat> mentally, the soundness, <laughs> I guess, needs to be there. A lot of times they're a little, a little difficult to deal with but um, very sound physically, um, structurally sound, um, although there are some compromises that I make when I try to find event horses. Um, I think that um, they need to be able to um, know that they're better than the average horse. Um, that's part of their attitude. They have to have some kind of showmanship about them. Um, very scopy jumpers, very brave. Um, and again, I go back to the point about the bonding. The horse has to like you and you like them, and there is a relationship unlike any other that needs to be developed. Through the years, they're not going to jump off of drops into water and over ditches in the dark unless they trust what you're pointing them at. And back to my point about his um, sore foot, his stone bruise, as we call it. Um, I could have tried to run him or compete him, but he would have probably felt some pain and maybe questioned my authority, and that would have perhaps hurt us in the long range with our career. So I really had no, no option but to scratch him from this competition, although it's one of the best in the country. I wish I could have competed Easter Parade at Ledger this year, but that's the way the ball bounces. And now on to the action. Here up in the Novice and Training Level Stadium, we had the top riders from the three teams in the Novice and in the stadium all clear. There was only one rider in the Novice divisions in the top four teams that had a rail, and only two riders in the top four teams in training had any difficulties in the show jumping. So a great finish to the competition, and here are the Area 8 team novice winners. Finishing up with a score of 101.4. We have Lisa Roebling on Nemesis, Barney Milady on Gabriel, Susan Cashel on Magic Omen, and Robbie Moon on Scamp. All finishing with no jumping faults right on their dressage marks. A final team score, 101.4. Congratulations, the Area 8 winning team. And the training winners, the mixed doubles from Area 1, the host area. And this team consists of Anthony Hahn with Adrian, Terry Barrett, senior class, Robert Wyatt and Jameson, and Lucy Schroer and Alec. A team score, 170.2. And, and we pick up the show jumping action in the preliminary three-day run with the current leader, Bruce Davidson and the Wolf. He's won the dressage. He was clear yesterday on the cross country, the speed and endurance. And here he is now on the course. Prior to Bruce's round, we had Nick Holmes Smith and Bruder Pest adding just five faults for a drop rail. So uh, he's currently in second. Darren Cha Cha and Labrette are in third with 67.1. Right now, Bruce does have a rail in hand. Clear at this point on the course. It's a beautiful course. It's been designed and built by Stephen Hales. Beautifully decorated. And as always, uh, a uh, fitting tribute to the final day of any ledger competition. Putting in another one of the 
is a very precise, very accurate, and highly controlled stadium rounds. And we said earlier, this is uh, one of his youngsters that he's been bringing up through the ranks. He's really uh, shown him what to do, how to handle himself. And down for the final triple, which has caused a lot of trouble today. And Bruce hits the rail there at the last element, but he's okay, the rail stays up. And Bruce goes clear to win this division with a final score of 55.5. There's Nicole Smith and Rudapest receiving their second place ribbon for the preliminary three day. And now into the winner's circle, and winner, Bruce Davidson the and the Wolf. The winners of the dressage clear on the cross country and the show Mr. jumping to wrap up with 55.5. Third place went to Darren Cha Cha. Wendy Stevenson was fourth. Tiffy Reed fifth with up the road again. And Ann Getchell and Lorenzo moved into sixth place with 77.0. She moved up from ninth to sixth. A nice way to finish off the competition for her, this being her farm here at Groton House. We now move to the final division, and this is the advanced division. And we pick up now with Karen Lendy and Park Hall. They are currently in second place. And they have penalties to date. 48.0. The advanced show jumping course has been uh, a problem for quite a few riders, especially that last triple. We have two very, very big Swedish oxers and a vertical. And a lot of rails have been coming down there. I'll call rubbing uh, part of the in and out. And a big jump over the oxer. And over the Liverpool. This Courtney Ramsey in stateside uh, picked up five faults for a drop rail on two and a half time faults, but he is now in third place with 58.5. And Bruce on needle sprints uh, had 10 uh, faults and one and three quarters time, so he's in fourth with his uh, first horse needle sprints, and he still has yet to come with Mystic Hazard, the leader. Well, there's Karen. She picked up a rail there and just uh, 0.5 time faults, so five and a half. And she has a new score now, 53.5. So she really puts the pressure on the leader now, Bruce Davidson and Mystic Hazard. Already a winner today in the prelim three-day. He's now on the course here in the advanced division. Here. Bruce has one rail in hand. That's all he can afford in the show jumping. Comes down to the in and out. Clear there. I see Bruce is really going for the clear round. He's not worried about the time. He can afford uh, some time faults. Drives on to the Liverpool. A big jump there. And then they have to check back to this vertical. It's all right. They're over eight there onto the stone wall. A little rub there. Oh, in fact, that rail popped off. So there is five faults. Now, Bruce, uh, Bruce can't afford any more penalties now. He did have one rail in hand, so it's all right to this point. I know that last triple is really, really come into play here. I know Bruce is concerned about it. He has to make sure he gets a good line here. First, the rub there, second, and up. Oh, unfortunately, a drop rail there at the end. So he's going to pick up 10 faults there, and uh, two time faults, a total of 12 faults. And unfortunately, that's very costly. It's going to drop him down to second place, and he will finish with 55.8. We have Jack and Madeline, and they are going to present Neil with a lovely silver photo frame which will include a photograph of all of the Olympic and United States equestrian team riders that attended that dinner the other night. And it will say with our appreciation and love 
to Mr. Neil Ayer, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, Neil Ayer, the general of the weekend, the man without whom none of this would be possible. We thank him very much for a tremendous job. Like, Everybody get in close together then. Hide my stomach with this. <laughs> this. Back this way, back. 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 In sixth place, we have Jiffy Reed and Lotus with a final of 64 points. So the winner of the advance will be Karen Lindy and Park Hall, winning by just uh, two points over Bruce Davidson and Mystic Hazard. Courtney Ramsey third with uh, Stateside. Bruce is fourth with Needle Sprints. David O'Connor and the Magic Dragon we'll move up to, to take Magic fourth Dragon place, a fifth place, excuse me. Jiffy Reed is sixth six. with Lotus. And with all the pageantry we have had here at Ledyard, a great way to finish off with a nice tribute to Neil Ayer. <laughs> from Jack and Madeline Legoff. Anybody else? Anybody else? Fourth class of appreciation and thank you. Going to the Commander-in-Chief, the man who has made Ledger what it is, one of the cornerstones in American eventing. Well, we hope you have uh, enjoyed the coverage here of Ledger 90. It's been and a fantastic place, week of competition. As we said, we had over 300 side. entries, and we ran about 290 of them. I think everyone really deserves a and tremendous amount of thanks Courtney and appreciation. And to all the competitors, we thank you for being here. And we hope that uh, you have really felt really a part of Ledger this weekend. Anywhere from the Coming novice right up through the advance. And here's the presentation now. Second place will go to Bruce Davidson and Mystic Hazard. For the award the winners in the final ways. division. For the advanced force finals. Well, this is Brian O'Connor thanking you all once again for being a part of the legend of Ledger. And the winner of Ledger 90 will be Karen Lindy and Park Hall in the advanced force final division with a final of 53.5. Owned by Dick and Peter Thompson. Karen was second after the dressage, only adding 5.5 here at show jumping. She winds up winning the final division of the day with 53.5. Once again, we thank Beverly National Bank as our sponsors of the day. And Julie Ropeshaw and Larry Smith representing the bank, along with Neil Ayer and Mr. O'Connor. He's been our ringmaster for the day. Here we are with Helen Ayer, the wife of Neil Ayer, and Helen and Neil are really Ledyard Farm. So Helen, what exactly do you do at Ledyard to make Ledyard happen? Well, I think what I like to do best at Ledyard is to take all the competitors and the many officials that come from all over the world and give them as best, as good a time as I can possibly manage to squeeze into the weekend 
And the way I do this is by asking many of my friends if they would like to participate and be part of the weekend by taking officials and competitors into their houses as guests. And I'm very, very fortunate, Neil and I, both fortunate to have such enthusiastic and really great friends because they do this. And this year at Ledger 90, we put up, rather my friends did, 90 officials. And we arranged parties for them and lectures and entertainment. And I think that this touch is what gives Ledger the, re the reputation of being such a a really hospitable and good fun event. And it is through the generosity of so many people that this is brought about. It seems that the entire town of Hamilton-Wenham comes out for Ledger. It seems everyone's really a part of it. I mean, the streets are crowded. You have so many spectators from around the area. I mean, it, it comes alive. Well, it really does. Uh, I think this area is a very horse-oriented and minded community. We have the driving competitions, we have polo, we have horse shows, we have um, trail rides, we have hunter paces, and these activities are joined in by a lot of the local people. So the moment they see anything to do with the venting, or uh, alleged particularly, they really turn out. And probably for a week before the event, we get many, many phone calls from all over the place wanting to know where, what time things start and how they're going to be. There's a tremendous amount of community support goes into this, not only with the stores, but with the police and the firemen doing the traffic control and the EMTs, and everybody really pitches in together. The first time Ledyard occurred, can you give us a little bit of, a little bit of a story about how you remember it? Well, I think the first Ledyard we had, the whole thing was handled, orchestrated, and created right out of my kitchen. We didn't have a headquarters or a scoring van, or we didn't have all these wonderful uh, control systems. We, it was a very, very small affair. And I remember Neil actually set the dressage rings up so close together that they were almost in each other's laps. And it was a very sort of friendly, always very friendly, but nothing compared to the organization and the smoothness and the, and the efficiency with which Alleged is run now. But it was still always great fun. Always. So what would you like to think that Ledyard 90, this particular Ledyard, this exciting event that happened this weekend, what would you like to think it left behind in the mind of eventers and spectators alike? Well, I think it left behind them a really good feeling about where the sport is going in this country, where it has come from, and what a wonderful opportunity it was to ride here at Ledger on this beautiful property. Earlier we were discussing how equestrian sports are looked at more or less from a social point of view, not really from a sporting point of view. Well, we're here in the northern part of Boston, and a lot of people look at it and say, well, gee whiz, this is the home of the rich and famous, or the rich and discreet, however you'd like to put it. But eventing's not that way. And you mentioned something about that yourself. How do you see eventing and how do you think the sport should really be taken up? Well, I think as you can just see how it's growing by the number of people who appear at events, even small unrecognized ones, there are more people coming. The word is getting around. Uh, I, I think that if you look at it, it's relatively new in this country compared to what they've been doing with this sport in Europe. And I think that, that we are growing and that it will get bigger and that hopefully, eventually, the newspapers will take it out of the social pages and put it in the sports section. Because I think that people are becoming a great deal more aware of how nice it is on a nice day to go out with their family into the country to take a picnic. I've seen this happen with polo. 
down here at Myopia Polo was a very small intramural kind of a way of playing it. And now they get thousands of people uh, at tournaments on weekends. So I think that as the following builds up, it will really take hold. So yourself, do you ever, do you ever ride yourself? Yes, I, I ride for pleasure. I have a very nice hunter, fully automatic with a reverse gear. And I particularly like to just ride through the country with my dogs. And I hunt a little bit. I don't do very much competition. I did at one point do novice. But what I really like to do is just ride around with my dogs and see the changing seasons and how beautiful the country is. And uh, I had a bad knee, and at one point I took up side saddle. And so that was rather good fun, it was a change. I think my horse simply loathes it, but I enjoy it. And so it's nice that I can do both and, and go in the little shows and, and just really have a happy time doing that. Well, here at Ledger this year, I noticed that you have a lot of people here at the Ledger Barn, a lot of competitors, a lot of well-known competitors, and you've opened up your doors well ahead of the event for young riders and for trainers to be around Ledger and be able to work. Have you found that exciting and fun to watch some of these young people practice and work? Yes, it, it has been very exciting and fun, and I want to say that they're all the, the, some of the nicest kids I've ever met. They were extremely helpful and very appreciative and never took advantage of either the property or the stable. They were delightful to have on the place and in the stable, and uh, I think they had a good time. Well, behind every great man, there is a great woman, and this is Helen Eyre. As a closing, what would you like to say about your dear husband, Neil? Well, I think he has done more for eventing in this country than anyone else. I think Jack Legoff, as his partner in crime, so to speak, they've been, they've been a very dynamic duo, and uh, I think that he has done a perfectly wonderful job uh, bringing the sport to this country. Okay. Anything you'd like to say to a Venice coast to coast just from you? Hang in there. <laughs>